The Exorcist, brought to us on the page by William Peter Blatty and on the screen by Oscar winner William Friedkin, is one of the most celebrated horror movies of all time. Most people know it was based on a book, with the author himself writing the adaptation for the screen. But did you know the events depicted within both mediums are loosely based on actual events? How close do they stick to the historical fiction, and what was changed for the benefit of both page and screen? Try to hold down your pea soup as we find out what the f really happened to The Exorcist. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Really Happened to This Horror Movie, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. The Exorcist took audiences by storm the day after Christmas in 1973, and then again in a re-release in the year 2000. All told, it would rake in a staggering $441 million at the box office, with much more coming on home video. In addition to the filmgoer excitement, it would ignite huge amounts of critical praise, culminating in the movie being nominated for a horror genre defying 10 Academy Awards, including the coveted Best Picture. While it wouldn't win that elusive award, it was still the first horror film to be nominated in that category, and would still take home statues for Best Sound and Best Adapted Screenplay. The winner is William Peter Blatty for The Exorcist. Not a bad deal for novelist Blatty, who got to adapt his own work and win an Oscar in the process. Blatty based his novel, and the characters within, on a couple different things. First and foremost, the story itself was inspired by Blatty coming across the true account of an exorcism while he was a student at Georgetown University. His teacher went over a few of them, but focused heavily on the story of Roland Doe. The two main priests that performed the exorcism had kept diaries of all the events, and Blatty was able to pour over them to craft his story. Many of the events described in both diaries were put in the novel and later film by William Friedkin, but there were also quite a few changes, some in the name of storytelling, and some in the name of decency to the real-life person and their family. What are some of the changes, you ask? Well, let's start with the centerpiece in both mediums. Reagan McNeil in the Blatty version of the events was a 12-year-old girl who in the movie adaptation was played to stark reality by young actress Linda Blair. While it's true that both the dramatization and the real-life events surrounded the purported possession revolving around a child, the non-fiction version of a 14-year-old boy named Roland, which we found out later was a fake name given to cover his gruesome ordeal. And frankly, it sounds made up. <laughs> A use of a Ouija board is important in both tales, but in the case of Roland, it's seen as the catalyst more than the fictional retelling. As here, it was his favorite aunt's death who sparked everything, and she's the one that taught him how to use the Ouija board. Another large part of Reagan's story is the fact that in terms of family, she only has her single-parent actress mother to take care of her, played in the movie by Ellen Burstyn. While she is obviously a caring and loving mother, she is also quite busy and there's no one else really to take care of Reagan other than her movie star and director friends. This is the first instance that Blatty decided to completely change the narrative, as young Roland was part of a rather large family that lived in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Later on in the narrative, the entire family moved to St. Louis to be with the remainder of their family after what they saw as a sign to go there to fix their son. While both stories start in D.C., the movie keeps the entire plot in the area around Georgetown, partly because that's where Blatty went to school, and partly to keep the characters and plot more concise. Reagan starts acting strangely, including unexplainable things happening in and around the house. She is then subject to a litany of medical tests where the doctors can find nothing wrong with her. Things get worse until one night her mother's friend who was there to babysit is found dead outside the house. We later learn in a conversation between Father Karras and the detective that the guy's head was turned completely around. Some of these strange occurrences are ripped straight from the two diaries, with strange scratching noises and leaking water, and especially Ronald, who many believe to be the real name of the boy in question, having his bed move all by itself. Ronald was also subjected to physical, mental, and even religious evaluations with no results. Where the true story breaks off is that Ronald never killed anyone while possessed. This is purely a plot point for dramatic effect. I didn't kill anybody. Reagan gets worse still, and the detective in charge of the death of her mother's friend, Kinderman, who here is played by Lee Cobb, reaches out to a mutual friend named Karis. Obviously, the Kinderman character is also a creation for the book and film, as there weren't any reported police activity surrounding the original exorcism. Karis is a priest struggling with his faith, but agrees to see the girl as it was recommended that an exorcism may be due, even just for emotional effect. Karis, played in a career-defining performance by Jason Miller, goes to the McNeil residence to see for himself. 
Father Karras speaks with Reagan and even tests her with things like fake holy water, which she does react to, and gets the famous green pea soup spit up onto his face before seeing the words help me scratched into her skin from an unseen force. While not wholly convinced, he decides that it's time to request an exorcism. The book and movie decide to invent way more gruesome details surrounding what the possession did to its host. There was never an example of Ronald's head turning completely around, he never projectile vomited green soup over any of the people that were trying to help, and there was never any record of anything like the infamous crucifix masturbation scene. While Ronald's exorcism was eventually handled by two priests, there was a prior attempt at exorcism done by Father E. Albert Hughes, who was the local Catholic priest for the family. He did see writing appear on the boy out of nowhere, but instead of help me, it spelled out Lewis, which the family took as a sign to go to St. Louis where they had even more family and help available to them. Blatty left all of this out, both to keep the plot in Georgetown and also not to add an extra character. The first exorcism overall was disrupted and stopped abruptly when Ronald broke part of his bed off and injured Father Hughes. Father Karras does get permission to perform the exorcism, but there's a caveat attached to it. He needs to have an experienced priest with him to help, one that has performed an exorcism before. This is where the film finally gets its holy pairing of Karis and Father Marin, portrayed by the late, more than great, Max von Sydow, who had to have old age makeup applied to better fit the character. The two men prepare for the exorcism, and Marin warns that they will be assaulted both emotionally and physically by the demon within Regan, and they begin their task. The demon Pazuzu inside the girl uses Karis' lack of faith and reeling guilt towards his mother's death to make him weak. When Marin sees his weakness, he tells Karis to rest, and unfortunately this is his downfall. Father Karis promises the girl's mother that her daughter will not die under his watch, and when he goes back in to see, he is now alone. Father Marin has died from the stress. Karis verbally and physically attacks Reagan until he tricks the demon into inhabiting his body, where he selflessly and heroically throws himself out the window to his death. While this version of the events is certainly exciting and perfect for a work of fiction like a book or a movie, it's almost completely made up. When Ronald's family got to St. Louis, they were put into contact with two priests from St. Louis University staff. Father Walter Holleran and Reverend William Bodern agreed to perform the exorcism on young Ronald, but, unlike the movie, they would use multiple assistants and later move the boy from his home to a hospital bed. Many of the strange occurrences, the violent outbursts, weird movements, bed shaking, that had happened the first go-around would also be present for the two Jesuit priests. However, the violence of the movie and the overtly strange occurrences were completely made up. While the film presented several terrifying acts of rebellion for the demon that was taking hold of Reagan, like the aforementioned vomiting, head-turning, and sacrilege, there were many things that were found within the two diaries that Blatty simply left out. Both priests claimed that they saw on multiple occasions a red X appear on Ronald's chest in the same manner that the word Lewis did earlier. At first they just assumed it was the beginning of a new word to come, but then came to the conclusion that it represented the Roman numeral for ten, and that in turn meant that there were actually ten demons cursing the poor child. Another big difference between the two stories is that the actual exorcism of Ronald Doe took place over quite a long time, especially compared to that of what we see on the film. The two priests worked day and night until the family finally had their son put in a hospital for the remainder of the ordeal. The day after Easter in 1949, after the placing of several holy artifacts on Ronald, he awoke and was free of his possession. Both priests had made it out alive. As you can see, the main story differs pretty wildly from the real-life events, but how about the characters? Well, we already went over some of the differences between Reagan and her real-life counterpart, including the gender swap and age change, but how about their fates? The character of Reagan would have to go on to deal with the events of The Exorcist 2, which is a fate arguably worse than the tragedy she suffered during the first film. Ronald Hunkeler, who we believe to be the identity of the boy in question, would go on to a pretty amazing life. He passed of a stroke in 2020, but not before putting an entire career into NASA, even helping with the Apollo moon landing. He would of course keep everything very close to the chest, as he wouldn't want to be a distraction or concern for those close to him or his co-workers. While both movie and book priests perish in their pursuit of healing the young McNeil girl, the real-life Jesuit priests would go on to live full lives. William Bodern would stay with the church his entire life and pass away in 1983, while Walter Holleran would make it all the way until 2005, becoming the last member of the team that performed the exorcism to die. Nearly everything we know from the events are thanks to both men keeping detailed diaries that Blatty would later get his hands on. Without these, we may never have had the best-selling novel or fan-favorite film. While Marin was in Iraq on an archaeological dig and had performed an exorcism before, and Father Karras had doubts in his faith and guilt over the passing of his mother, neither of the true-life priests had anything so showy going on. 
These were simply plot and character points to add extra dimensions to heroic, but ultimately ordinary men. While the book and movie versions are very close in overall plot and characters, they do have differences in execution and nuances within each other, even with author William Peter Blatty being the one to write the script. While not on the level of Ed Gein being merely an inspiration for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but otherwise having nothing to do with it, the events that took place in 1949 as the basis for The Exorcist are very different to what we read in the book or see in the movie. While the true life events are undeniably harrowing, the flair and character pieces that could only be added by a writer and in the way which Freakin put together the movie make for a very exciting and worthwhile experience.